then I found out that the list of stuff that I still need to do is is quite is is quite vast. And um, so here we go. It, it's it's on record now, so that's brilliant. So when I when I was going through this, I I thought that I was going to do swans come today, and I, I wanted I, I wanted to look at this swans come site, and then I realised I hadn't done Pont Newis in North Wales. And then I realized that there were other sites I hadn't done from the uh, Paleolithic period that were as equally as important as lots of the Paleolithic sites that we've looked at. And I thought, well, we'll do more Paleolithic stuff next week. And also there's new stuff coming out in, um, in you know, in, in, the, in the journals. And the new stuff coming out is that there's, there's, um, there's Neanderthal um, stroke uh, Denisovian groupings um, of, of DNA. So we need to look at that, M not next week, but the following week. So I'm not going to close down the Paleolithic period because there's so much that I still need to do. So it was it was wise for me to sort of put the brakes on today so that I could I could realize that there's so much that I need to encapsulate. So what, one, of the, one of the things that I did on Tuesday was to get my little my little chart up, my, my little drawing board. Now, the, the advantage that we've got with this uh, technology of Zoom is very similar to the technology that I would have had with the old computer, which we've still got. And we've got the luxury of, of the wonderful whiteboard. And... Yeah, the whiteboard itself, you know, I can just scribble along as I used to do in my classes, but it's a lot more easier, this whiteboard. So when when we've been talking about when we've been talking about the word um, glacial, glacial, you know, the glacial period, I, I've got to remind myself that the glacial period ended 12,000 years ago. So that's the date that we've been doing. Glacial period. And you're seeing this on your screen, yeah? Yeah, I can see this, yeah. Right, the glacial period ended twelve thousand years ago, but we're clear about that. We, we we haven't we haven't gone away from that. And one of the other things that I've one of the other things that I've said is that the next period that we do have, hang on, is it is it allowing me to? Oh, hang on a minute. It's not let let me to rub this out. Hang on. Is this okay? If we stop that doing that. Uh, clear, clear my drawings. Good, if they are drawings. And then the next thing that we did say was that eight thousand five hundred years ago, that's when it's the end of our Mesolithic period. So our Mesolithic period ends eight thousand five hundred years ago. So the Mesolithic period, in my in my reckoning, right, begins twelve thousand years ago and ends eight thousand five hundred years ago, right, which is slightly different than in the ancient Britain book. But the reason reason why we've said to get the ancient Britain book is to try to tie in with the images and some of the facts it's got in there, but not necessarily the dates. So when, whenever whenever I've been doing this sort of this early prehistoric stuff, uh, one one of the thing one of the things I've been one of the things I've been saying um, is that one of the things I've been saying is that the dates will always change. So I I've been painfully aware that when I started teaching that this this type of archaeology in 2007, and we had the ancient Britain book, the dates have changed quite some quite a few times. So, but it's mainly it's mainly the content rather than the dates that I want wanted people to look at. So we've mentioned the word glacial, and we are now in an interglacial. Right. So. Um, so the, the word. What, what we what we've said about this. Um, and, I've, and I've got my little notes on here is that within within the interglacial, with, if we if we go here within what we call an interglacial, we're actually in, in, in we're in an interglacial now that began 12000 years ago. Yeah, we're in an interglacial. So beyond before 12000 years ago, glacial. We're in the interglacial um, since 12,000 years. Our interglacial has lasted 12,000 years. 
So that's nice. So the next thing, the next thing we want to do now is we want to um, mention something else uh, that is equally something that I've mentioned, but I haven't given a word to it. The word stadial and the word interstadial. Now, quickly, the word stadial um, are periods of colder climate. Well, interstadials are periods of warmer climate, right? So you could use the word stadial in, in my reckoning. This is my reckoning. So approximately, we're going to bring up about approximately, not about, this is quite precise. In the year um, 1315, that's quite a precise date, isn't it? AD. In the year 1315, from that moment onwards, we've got something known as the mini ice age, right? So. Yeah. Okay. The, yeah, the mini ice age is called, is in other words a stadial. Yeah, that's called a stadial. That's the mini ice age. So then, the other thing as well is that I have mentioned over the past few weeks that may have confused people. I need need to sort of benchmark this before before the ice before the ice started to melt big time twelve thousand years ago. There was approximately sometime around 13,000 years ago, you could be a bit more precise than this, at 12,000 years ago, there was a stadial. There, there, was a, there was a massive cold spit. There was a huge cold spit within the, within the glacial period. So it was believed that things started to warm up a little bit, but not enough 13,000 years ago for the ice to completely disappear. And then it got really cold. It got really cold. It got very, it got very, very cold. Yeah, which is a stadial within in, within um, a glacial period. Right? How cold are we talking? Uh, how cold? Um, we, we, you know, you know what I, you know what I like to do at this stage. I, I like to do, um, I, I, I like to do um, just chuck a figure out at you because. Yeah, you know, the, the, the true reality is, is that we don't really know. But to get to get an idea of what I'm just about to explain, right? We 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 need to chuck a figure at you. This is what archaeologists do. We like to chuck figures at people. I don't like doing this, but when we, when we're looking at um, Paleolithic times, um, it's such a wide area. We're not going to get the 14th of October at 12:15 in the year um, um, 13,024. We're not going to get that. So we got a, we got a benchmark. So so we're talking about. Um, what we're talking about is minus um, minus 40 degrees C in the winter months. Um, it's likely that between 13,000 and 12,000 years ago, it may have got colder than that. Or it got to minus 30 degrees C in the in the winter months. And then it got back to minus 40 degrees C for approximately 13,000 years ago to 12,000 years ago. And suddenly the temperature rose, rose quite rose quite massively and we're not talking about we're not talking about you know um a quarter of a degree we're talking about one or two degrees so the summer temperature was was rising quite dra dramatically so instead of being 40 degrees minus 40 degrees c in the in the in the winter months it's minus 38 degrees and 36 degrees and and 30 and, and get to 16 degrees minus so it was a massive difference so what that would mean it would have a, a huge effect on the summer months so the summer months are going to be longer right because the temperature is 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 is, is dropping uh, uh no because the temperature is rising i meant dropping as in you know it, it it's, it's not as cold um so what we're talking about is um yeah we're, we're moaning about minus we're minus at this minute we're talking about increases of temperature of 0 0.05 degrees on or 0 0.1 degrees and that's quite dramatic so if you're talking about a rise in temperature of one or two degrees, that that's 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 systematically and psychologically dramatic for any animals and human beings that are within uh, this northern climate. Right. So then then what we've got to discuss, what I want to do to try and, you know, we have gone off on tangent, but we haven't because this is what I want to do, because what we did do on Tuesday, the class went on until about 10 past 10, and we'd started roughly um, 20 to 8. Because I asked everybody questions. I said, what, what, what problem do you have with what we're doing? And, and we, we examined this. So this is your problem, right? So what I need to do now is I need to give you a demonstration of acute temperature change.
and the, and um, and um, oh, what what we do see is that um, the word that we give um, for this this period, um, if if we there's something known as the um, if I if I type it in here to just do a, a fact check, the word dryas rings a bell, um, and then so what what we've got we've got um, the younger dryas, right? Um, the younger dryas is is what's known as a return to very cold conditions. So that period that we're talking about, um, the the dates the dates are slightly skewed in what I'm looking at because I, I've rounded mine up. Right. So um, we're talking about 13,000 years ago um, to 12,000 years ago. So my dates on here are slightly different. It's called the Younger Dryas period. But again, we're benchmarking this. We're trying to put things together. Right. So it's known as the Younger Dryas. So that was the cold period. That's when things got really cold. Right. So then then what we do have um, is that what we do see. Um, not in the west, not in the western hemisphere, but in Greenland, um, we 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 see we see that if we if we type in here, we see that conditions in Greenland were suitably warm enough that the climate in Greenland um, is a place that that Vikings can settle around uh, around um, the year. Hang on a minute, it's not letting me do it. Right, hang on. Oh, stop it. Right. Um, so approx approximately um, this this date. So uh, um, hang on. No, stop it. Stop. Hang on. Get my dates mixed up. Right. I, I, I'm in 10,000. So what we need to do around this date, AD, a thousand years ago, this is in Greenland when 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 temperature was warm enough to for people to live in Greenland. Right. So what's happened before? Before ten thousand, uh, before a thousand years AD, one thousand years ago, a thousand years AD, one thousand years ago in Greenland, right? The temperatures had risen suitably enough for people to live in Greenland, right? We didn't see it, but by around, by around, by around thirteen hundred, temperature had dropped enough in Greenland that things were really bad. So they were get they were getting cold temp they were getting cold conditions. So so what was happening leading up to this date in Greenland temperature was rising, but as no sooner had Vikings started to occupy Greenland, sometime between um, this date um, one thousand years AD and um, twelve hundred years AD, which is eight hundred years ago temperature was slowly dropping and so by 1300 things were catastrophically collapsing in greenland right now that when when we're when we're going this this would be the stadial event and then there's suddenly the stadial event by 1315 in, in europe was acutely obvious and the the, the 1315 in europe up until 1347 when the plague started it hit um, um the mediterranean by the time the plague hit us, um, the damage had been done, so things were quite terrible, right? But we there there is there is a time that there is a time in the medieval period where we talk about an um, an interstadial, uh, where things suddenly get really warm in the medieval period for for a short period of time, and suddenly things collapse. So this is why this is why in the medieval period we see things are things are going really well, you know. Yeah, um, population in, by about 1300 in, in, in Britain, the population had probably increased to 7 million people. By 1352, it probably collapsed to about two, two and a half, which was a catastrophic collapse. So you, you, you could mirror the word stadial and interstadials with um, human population changes. So again, stadial is when you get a cold time, interstadial is we get a warm time. That's what we're talking about. So, um, I have, I, I, to be honest with you, I've oversimplified interglacial and I've oversimplified glacial 12,000 and interglacial because it makes things easier for me, but it hasn't made things easier for me when we get events that don't fit in with what I'm telling you. So this is why we've, 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 we've gone down this, this avenue. 
so um so this this is what we were, were talking about and um and people wanted again to have a refresher about what the words um anti-quem and post-quem mean so post-quem is post-quem is the beginning of a period and the anti-quem is the end of the period um then um then the word post means after so um so so we have to differentiate between the meaning of post which is earlier when we use the word quem and antiquem which is the end the limit of something and then then we take ourselves out of that scientific description within latin and, and then we say right the word post in another context means after so um so it, it, sometimes archaeology can be more complicated than it needs to be so i've overcome i've I've undercomplicated it to make it easier, but then when we get when we get problems with the descriptors, um, it doesn't make things easier for me, and it doesn't make things easier for me that I say go out and go and get a copy of Ancient Britain when I'm disagreeing with the dates. So then I've got to say the reason why I disagree with the dates is is not the the dates themselves, is we agree with the content, because the dates are forever changing, and and that that's the important thing. It's the facts that are important, not the dates. This is this is what I this is what I always um, intimately want to get across, right? So so we've done that. What I what I think I need to do, I need to get the vagaries of 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 not what we've been saying, getting the vagaries, and then bring in the prehistoric stuff that we did after this on Tuesday. Um, and the the site that I want to mention is if we. If we click, if we click that off, um, clear that, and we we think of if I try if I go off that, um, and we do um, this, and the what we were meant to do today was a site known as Swanscombe, but then I realised that the topic of Swanscombe was 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 too much. Um, on the back of what we've what we've been doing um so what i did i did an introduction i basically said swanscombe now now swanscombe is is south on the river thames so we we got an idea where we are um this article refers to a skull at swanscombe and another site known as Eb, um, ebb's fleet um, and I just thought, right, we're not going to do Ebb's fleet and the elephant there. We're going to focus on the Swanscombe skull. Now, this is from an article. Now, if we if we go back to this article, which is dated 2020, and I say that the Swanscombe skull dates to 400,000 years ago. This is why I needed to spend a bit more time on this, because if you if you type in, if you go through the descriptor, um, on, if you, I've got my book on swans coming in front of me, right? And um, if we, if we, if we look and we see what it's saying about swans come, instead of the swans come skull, skull being four hundred thousand years ago, it says that the swans come skull dates to two hundred thousand years ago. So, um, and this, this, this here is dated. The information dated that I've just read about swans come being four hundred thousand years ago dates to. 2020 the stuff in the book in front of me dates to the early 1980s so if we if we if we go on to swanscombe again and we get another more up to date on swanscombe right so this is why I, I wanted to take my time on this so we type in swanscombe skull see what i'm doing i'm using i'm using three sources of information to get this so if we if we type in the the one the one source I don't know if you've ever used it is is Britannica instead of over over the likes of uh, uh, the reason why I'm giggling is that I wasn't expecting what I was going to find. So so if you if you sometimes the the Young Encyclopedia Britannica usually gives you some nice stuff. So Encyclopedia Britannica tells me now that the swans come stole skull dates from three hundred thousand years ago. Not the two hundred thousand in the book, and not the four hundred thousand, which is on the 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 um on on the uh, press release. So that, so, but now we've got another four. Now we've got the the third source I was going to do 
um, was actually the typical um, uh, the typical Wikipedia entry, right? Um, which is sometimes updated. Um, and I've got another source, which is the Swanscombe Heritage site that doesn't give us a date, thank you very much, which is very helpful. So I think this has demonstrated that if you, if you, this is, this is the whole point. If you, if you focus on dates, you, you miss the narrative. And the narrative is that this, this Swanscombe skull um, is, you know, has, has another level of importance. Uh, and you've got some really nice, nice images in connection with the Swanscombe skull. So if I, if I click to, again, I wanted to do this next week, but you're not actually with us next week, are you? Uh, let me do, I'll check on that when we have a bit of a gap. I don't think you are. I think that's the one you said you weren't going to be with us or somebody wasn't. I, so if we, if we look at the images of Swanscombe skull now, oh, again, I've got to make sure that, I got to make sure that I keep my powder dry on this. So, um, I, I it, it was an issue. I'm looking at images online. All right, Dan. Well, I, I've got I've got our image now as well. So if we go with that, um, yeah, yeah we got we've got that now. Yeah, we've got three bits of this Swanscombe skull, which is great. Um, so so we got the um, we got the back uh, parietal. Um, this is this, this, so. If you look there, that that's basically where it hits the spine, right? And you've got obviously right. the top of the cranium, and you've got the front the front stuff gone, right? The front stuff is gone. So again, I'm I'm gonna I, I, what I'm gonna do, I, I'm just gonna I can read a bit of the article of the week, and then that lead, that will lead us nicely into next week, and then that ties us directly into what I've got in front of me. So um, so some. Sometime my my um the class that I tried this out on is actually my my Tuesday evening class, and um so so usually by by the time I get it to you, and then I get it to Monday, uh, by Monday it's it's quite refined. But what I've done is is I I've I've made the point. Of of why I was doing a prehistoric review on Tuesday, so I'm justifying it, and I'm also justifying the issue of dates, not to be obsessed with dates. Um, there there is there are areas in in history that the dates are important, like AD 43, the um uh, the 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 beginning of the Roman era in Britain, um, 1066, 14th of October. Now we're being really specific. Um, the Battle of Hastings, um, um, and at the beginning of the first, the, the, the beginning of the Second World War, um, the first of September 1939, and the end of the Second World War, the second of September 1945 in Japan. So, so that's when dates are important. Uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, the sixth and the eighth of August. So, so that I, I think that's right with the, with the two bombs. That's when dates are really important. Because um, you know it, it it does set the scene, you know. For example, Brexit. I can't even. Was it Brexit that was first of January? I can't exactly remember. Right. Um, but that's going to be important, or is it? But but there are there are when you go back so far in time, it doesn't really matter how old a skull is, but it's bloody old. Um, so if we if we take if we take the date out of the headline. And then we say, um, thankfully, for the residents of Swanscombe, uh, they don't have to travel to piece together a vital piece of early human history. And I think the word piece is referring to um, the three chunks of skull that were recovered over a series of time. And again, this article is written in a form that is useful for us. It's, it's in, it's a um, Kent newspaper, 2020. It's hard to imagine now, but homes along the Thames estuary were once on land which hyenas, cave lions, and huge mammoth sized elephants freely roamed, like it. We're gonna remove the date from this article. They were joined by perhaps the town's oldest residents, 
um, an ancestor of the Neanderthal species known as swans come woman. So, so we're going to remove the word woman there as well. Swanscombe is one of the, the two sites in Britain where actual human remains of this very early period have been found. Now, when you use the word one of two, let's remove that as well, because there's other sites that human remains have been found of at, and they date from an incredible period of time. So we've got Boxgrove. Yeah, um, we, we, we've got when we look at um, early sites that we've been doing in, for example, Bricksworth, uh, Bricksworth, uh, Brixham that we did last week. Um, and, you know, let's be unspecific there. So the remains were found in a gravel pit and eventually three bits of skull were found. Um, and the sex was deemed to be male and now to be female. This is why I said this is irrelevant. But what we do have is the remains of a hominid from that period of time that makes it more attractive to us understanding. And it was discovered in 1935 by a local dentist no, known by the name of Marston. We've got a specific date, the 29th of June, 1935, but that is not important. What is important, it was found in a, in a gravel pit, in a gravel quarry, um, by this chap, Alvan Theodophilus Marston. Now, some of the stuff that I, I, I really struggle with, um, he, uh, he, he dug into this quarry quite a depth to try and find some history, right? Now, what is relevant is he went to find the history. He dug eight meters, eight meters in, 90, in eight meters in 1935 um, to find some Paleolithic archeology. span Now, what is interesting about that is that that does tie us in with the point that I've made over the past few months. And the point is a, is a fair and an unfair point. If the Leakies hadn't have gone to North Africa, uh, well, not North Africa. Well, it's between North Africa, isn't it? It's, um, it's not exactly south, it's in the middle. So equatorial Tanzania, and then obviously we've got Kenya and we've got the old divide gorge, Tanzania. Um, if they'd gone to Mongolia instead, they may have come up with the same results. What I'm saying by mast and digging within this gravel pit at, Swan at Swanscombe, he found the evidence he needed. But then we go down another rabbit warren and we then look at the likes of the Piltdown Man forgery. And, and we, we think about um, Charles Dawson's forgery. And what, 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 we, what we see is that if you, if you dig deep enough, or as in Charles's case, don't dig deep enough and just fake it, you will find the results or you'll get people to believe the results. Now, it, it makes sense for me to make the following statement. If Charles Dawson had been a genuine archaeologist and he'd actually dug down, he may have found the evidence that he wanted to give to people anyway. So he was a fool to himself. Because he was a fool to himself. Because we bring in that other character, that great antiquarian, Clement Reed, who actually chose to look and find the evidence just as Marston did in his gravel pit in Swanscombe. As the same with Pengelly when Pengelly had been excavating at Kent's Cavern and Brixham Caves. He, he looked and he found the evidence. And then it goes to something else. Um, I don't know if you ever saw um, Bone Kickers, that six part series with um, Julie Graham and Hugh Bonneville Carter. Um, um, that was in 2008. And I love that because I hated it at the time. I told people not to watch it and I really regretted that because there, there was a great deal of science in it and there was a great deal of science in it from my friend, um, uh, uh, Professor Mark Horton, who did the science for the series. I didn't know there was science in the series. I thought it was just a bit of a joke, but it wasn't. It was serious stuff. So um, 
when when Mark Horton was um, doing this research, anyway, he must have written it down. And, and Julie Graham said in it, she said somebody, she was on a development site, and I think the first episode, and this developer come up and said, oh, why have we got to stop the work for this? There's obviously nothing in the ground. And she said, there will always be something in the ground. There's always something wherever you dig. And when you think about it, that's everything that we've just said. That's from a TV fictional series about archaeology. But that was very, very accurate. So a bone, a bone, one of the skull bones was protruding. I, mean, I, I think it was a parietal bone at the back. I, I think we'll come to that next week. Um, so the story goes, he was unsure whether it, uh, whether to retrieve it straight away in the absence of photographic evidence and thus risk controversy over its location or leave it in the same spot. Now, that's interesting. That takes us back to um, our Charles Dawson and the uh, the forger at Piltdown, where here's the evidence. Where did it come from? Arthur Ketch went to the site. And as Arthur Ketch has is, is, is gone off site, um, it looks like... Um, Dawson fakes the evidence for Arthur Keats to find. Now, Marston was very aware of this, that, he, that he's found something by digging, genuinely, um, and he doesn't want to be seen as a, a forger. He eventually decided to remove it and mark the spot before leaving the fragment with a chemist on Milton Street. After his finding, he returned every weekend with his teenage son, John, and is said to have been so relentless in his pursuit that he even erected a wooden hut to sleep in. Nearly a year later, on March the 15th, so this guy is the same age as me. <laughs> Nuts. <laughs> Nearly a year later, shut up. Nearly a year later, um, on March the 15th, so this is 19, so now we're in 1936. I don't see... The thing is, I don't see the relevance of these dates. I really don't. I, I really don't. But the, the dates give credibility to the article. Do you see what, see what we did there? So yeah. we need credibility for the find. Um, so whenever you're looking at archaeology and you want to put something across, you need to look at the relevance and just ignore the irrelevance. But the relevance here is actually date is 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 part of the, the story. So the pair were, were rewarded for their persistence when they uncovered another piece of the skull. Now, there was another piece of skull found. Um, and today the the, the point the, the place is marked with a piece of granite uh, that marks the spot of, of Marston's miraculous original find. Now um so basically what, what, what we've got, uh, yeah, I've actually got to correct myself. That, um, I didn't, um, yeah. So the left parietal bone, do you know what? I need, I need to look this up. I need to, I need to get this, hang on a minute. I, I always thought the parietal bone was the one at the back. I just got to, just got to double check this a minute. Um, so double check something. Uh, parental bone. Uh, rental bone. Hang on a minute. We're coming up with it. Ah, uh, right. Hang on. No, no. Hang on. Right. Okay. Here we go. Ah, right. No. Right. The parietal bone is the side bit, just before, just before the frontal bone, which holds the yeah. So the oct, oct, um, um, oct, occipital, oct. Oh, octopal bo bone. The octopal bone is the one that carries the spine or, or is linked to the spine, octopal bone and the parietal bone. So, yeah, so I needed to correct myself on that. So, um, so the parietal bone is the side, octopal bone is the one that you can see at the back. So what we need. So basically the left parietal was found. So glad we got that. And they, they, they've, they've got the two. So you've got the original and um, you've got the left parietal. Um, and it said we had encountered a pocket of bones, including a rhinoceros tooth, uh, early in the day. But in the later afternoon, I began to encounter the parietal bone. There could be no doubt about it. Mr. Martin Marston would continue to search the pit for many years after, after, but without any success. Bloody hell, I'd hate to be his wife. I really would. <laughs> right. 
Um, I don't know how long he went on for, but um, he was not the one who had actually found 20 years later um, the final piece of the skull or, or the third piece of the skull. And the whole the whole point of this story, it's, it's almost as if it's a microcosm for everything that we've done the past few months. Well, not everything we've done. So, so what, when, when, we, when we talk about Pengeli's work last week, we talked about Pengeli's work within uh, Brixham um, in, in, in 1847. He, he, he just, he, he, um, oh, he, oh, hang on, get my dates wrong. Yeah, yeah. No, he goes at Kent's Cavern in 1947, right? But he's aware of the Brixham, Brixham Caves. That's right. And then he goes to Brixham in um, 1858. So he's in Kent's Cavern, 1847. He's in uh, Brixham, 1848. And then um, he's back at Kent's Cavern in um, 1865. Now, this is where dates are really relevant. But what, what, what we're doing along that is we're, we're, we're trying to track a course of discovery to enhance the earlier discoveries. So he doesn't, he's lucky he doesn't work at Kent's Cavern in, in 1847 because he has not got the archaeological techniques to work at Kent's Cavern in 1847. Um, he de develops them at um, Brixham in 1858, ready for a massive full scale excavation for 15 years at Kent's Cavern. That's why this is relevant. Right? So the story doesn't end there at uh, Swan's Cavern. Um, but that's where we end today, because at Swanscombe, we, we go back to when it's the place of a quarry in 1877, and that's where we'll stop that today. So what we now need to do, we, we need to look at, we need to look at what's called distant figures in the myths of time, which is really which, which is really that sort of um, uh, uh, the, the final epitaph of everything that we've doing in the Paleolithic period, but we're doing it now. Um, and then we'll just, I just say, we've done the Paleolithic period, we'll just move on. But I needed to do this. So um, one, 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 one thing that I would say is that um, when, when we decided that, so if we if we move out of that and we go back to stop that there, when we decided when 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 we decided that we were going to do prehistory, um, I said that I wanted to do a bit of Neolithic and a bit of Paleolithic and a bit of Bronze Age and a bit of early Paleolithic. And somebody said, hang on, wait, 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 we're not going to do that because we're just not going to get it. And I'm glad I didn't do that. What I wanted to do, I wanted to, um, I wanted to preach to the masses. I wanted to do what may have seemed to be boring, boring Paleolithic archaeology has not been. It's been absolutely massive and fascinating, right? And then put some really exciting stuff in like Stonehenge and then go back to Paleolithic. I'm glad I didn't do that. I'm really glad I didn't do it. Because we've started to uncover that the Paleolithic stuff is more intriguing and more fascinating and more amazing than, than we could have ever given it credit for. In, in, in so many ways, um, the Paleolithic period has been the model for every other period that we're going to look at. So beginning at the beginning, basic rule, nice. Um, but again, it's not easy to understand the beginning of Paleolithic, the Paleolithic world. Because there is the disorder that I wanted to avoid, and what what we're talking about, what we're talking about that is something that we didn't discuss on Tuesday, but I did intimate that. It's something I did last night. Now, what, what what I said last night, what what we did last night was the the um, the development of the wheel, and what actually is a wheel, and a wheel is a straight line. Uh, and it keeps going in a circle. I'm doing lines. That's what I've been teaching on a Wednesday. I've been doing lines for months. Everything is a line. Everything is beginning and end, but the end is the beginning and it recycles and all that type of stuff. And so many different pathways. So a line, a line is 
is not necessarily straight. A line doesn't need to be linear. A line can just keep going in any direction, like a wheel. Anyway, the one thing I said is that um, what actually did come first? Did a wheel come first to move something, or did a wheel come first to be used in um, uh, as 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 a, um, a a spinning loom, or did a wheel come first to create pottery? Did a wheel come first as as a log to move stones? Uh, did a wheel come first as a child's toy? What came first? We're not answering that because we haven't got an hour. But but what we are going to say is this. I've presumed and I made you to presume or have I or have, have we have we left it enough room to think that did we come down from the trees in Africa or did we come down from the trees somewhere else? Or wherever we come down from the trees, did we start off in a tree in the first place? Did we start on the ground? Did we go into a tree? And did we start making tools? What I've done, maybe, or maybe I haven't, because I need to go over everything, which I haven't got time to do. Did we came? Did we come out of a tree and start walking and use tools? Did we start using tools, but we did hadn't come out of a tree yet? Do we still work walking on all fours? Um, um, at the same point that we were grinding things and then we started walking upright. Did we start make, making fires before we came down properly out of trees and start walking in a bipedal way? The answer is all of it. We actually don't know because if, if walking upright um, is not as much of an advantage as making a fire, then you're gonna make the fire first. And, and the simplest way of looking at this is do we do we um, but ba basically natural yeast is everywhere. Right. Um, so accidental yeast. Um, in the fermenting process. Did did um, fermenting liquid. OK, if you got fruit, here you go natural yeast and all the rest of it, acids and so on. So. Did did the um did we start drinking um an alcoholic based substance before we started making bread, or did or did or was or, or did was some bread left in water that that um do you know what came first? It's the chicken and the egg scenario, but it's a lot more complicated than that. When you're chicken and egg scenario, um. Um, that is quite simple compared to the process of you can you can I, either say one or the other, but you can't do that with when we're talking about human evolution and how the mind develops. There is the other thing as well is if you give um, if you give somebody um, a cart in um, in Papua New Guinea to forest dwellers, if you give them a cart. The cart's going to stay there because they've got no use for the cart. How are you, how are you going to move the cart along? How are you going to move a cart in, in amongst the woods in a tropical rainforest? Because there's no use to, use to it. But they might take a wheel off and they might start making pottery. In, in Central America, they, the, we, we, we're pretty sure that the, the wheel was not, um, in, in essence, available. A wheel. The wheel wheels were available in Amer in the Americas for uses in other ways, but we but all the evidence tells us that the the pottery in the Americas was was not made on the wheel, but they are perfectly made. So they didn't need the wheel because they they could make pots without the need of the wheel. So um, it's all about need, and and when we do look at prehistory, it's all about need. It's it's all about um, it, it's it's all about trying to understand trying to understand something that does not need to be complicated because humans just take the best path. Many humans just just take the the, the best way to get from A to B. And um, I, I, I bump into this chap on a regular basis every time I'm posting letters. Right, he always I always see him every single day. Right. Because he lives next door to the post box, so he comes out and he says, "I'm going somewhere." So yesterday I said, "Why? Why you, you don't like walking?" And he says, "No, I don't like walking. I just get him from A to B." And the reason why I see him a lot, he goes from A to B and he comes back. 
And then when he needs to do something else, he goes from A to B and he comes back. He does not stop in the way in the anyway. Right? Most people would do everything in one trip, but that's his way of doing things. So the story of man in Britain, the story of man on on the planet, is is one of 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 ex, extensive expanses of time and expanses extensive uh, changes with everything. And you know when we talk about everything. One minute human beings um, are living alongside uh, mammoths, and the next minute they're not living alongside mammoths, and we're isolated on an island. So we've got to make do with what we've got. It's all about making do, and it's all about um, that sort of change. But there is one thing that we can say about one thing that I that I haven't said, and one thing I'm going to say now, um, and I don't think I've. I've really said this at all um, in months, or, or I've said it, that um, I th think I said it once. Um, the, the Paleolithic period is a very, very slow period of human evolution. Is that is that a true statement? Let's examine that a moment. Because um, what, what, what we do find is that in this century, if we want to encapsulate this century in two minutes, we get to 1914 and the planet is on the edge of peace and the planet is on the edge of technological innovations that could have taken us to the moon, say, in the 1950s. I don't think it would have, but maybe it could have, right? And in a moment, all that technological innovation was used for other purposes. And, and in a way, that destroyed humanity. That event in 1914 destroyed everything. It, 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 um, it was the one event in history that will be forever remembered as, as one of the worst events in humanity, 1914. It wasn't about the killing fields. It was about everything that was lost. It was about one minute. We were on the edge of everything. You know, um, there, were, there were wars going on. But when you when you when you clarify that those wars were backwater wars, they, they, you know, 1914 changed everything. It, it, it was the worst thing ever to happen. Um, you know, it doesn't matter. It does matter, right? If atomic bombs went off today, right, they would not, it would not be as relevant. It would be relevant because millions of people would die. But the point is, if atomic bombs went off now, right, We've lost the opportunity to be humanity. Humanity was in 1914 and it all went. Most of it went. So that's that's one event. And 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 then then we moved from building tanks and aeroplanes and V2 rockets and being able to go to the moon and all these other things to creating um sub technological advances which are massive to us today because we're teaching like com computerization and the microchip and all these other things. Um, and, 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 and then in 1977, we, we launched supersonic um, aircraft like, uh, like Concorde and we can't fly supersonic Concords today. I don't get it, but what's happened with our technology, right? But within this, within this period of a hundred years that I'm talking about 1914 was the worst event. And we, we, our, our minds um, devolved, but we still kept on producing this technology that is in many respects not uh, not really aiding us. It's, it's not making us any happier, right? 1914, all that stuff was making us happy. It doesn't anymore, right? But so many things have happened. Did that happen in prehistory? For example, if we, if we look at... Um, if we look at uh, a, a date 14,700 years ago, which is a date that we see in regards to Goff's cave, Cheddar Gorge, we see that human remains and animal remains are being treated in exactly the same way, i.e. Um, the, they're being defleshed. What does that mean? Or they're cannibals. No, I didn't say they were cannibals. But the text said that the human beings were cannibals. They were eating human flesh all right but the animal remains being treated the same way what does that all tell us right 
is is that technological innovation that they might have actually not been eating the flesh they may have actually been taking the flesh off for another purpose but what does all that mean um being able to survive being able to um have levels of communication and society uh technology that we don't have anymore or technology that's been lost right over over that period of time and, and actually actually how dare i even say that technology was slow how dare i even say that humanity was slow to change tell you what being being isolated as an island um 8500 years ago um is as dramatic as what happened in 1914 to the british isles we're talking about the british isles now yeah but it's the same it's the same type of thing okay um we always talk about oh sorry little britain being isolated as an island but that must have had a, that must have had a massive impact on the continent you know we always talk about us we're really selfish in britain we always we always talk about doggerland and we always talk about the loss of our technology and we always talk about the loss of our civilization and we and and overnight we had to make do right we had to make do um i'm not saying I'm not going to refer to you, Henry. I'm not going to refer to me. But both of us have had events in our lives that have meant that we've had to refound ourselves. We've had to, we've had to um, reinvent ourselves. We, we, well, I have, and I'm, I'm sure you have as well. And that we've had traumatic, traumatic things happening to us. But, but we've had to move on. We've had to reinvent ourselves. Think about a whole people losing everything, having to be isolated in Britain. By having to reinvent everything again. And if that's not massive advances in ideas and technology, I don't know what is. So we can't, we can't, we can't. In mo lots of the textbooks say that technology was slow to advance. It took thousands of years for things. I, I'm not going with that anymore. I can't go with that anymore because um, I can't because we're seeing so much evidence to tell us the contrary um and the, the the story in britain um runs across a million years um and it there there are there are so many alarming events and there are so many differences of events um, and, and what what we do see is those changes. We now we can use those words in context. We see interstadials, where 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 humanity. We see interstadials of humanity where we get um, hippopotamuses living alongside humans, lions living alongside hu humans, hyenas living alongside humans. And the next minute, you get um, things get cold again. You're back in the glaciation. Um, and what what I what I feel is is massive here is is the ability of human beings to to see each other as human beings. So we we see. Homo erectus, for example, and we see Homo sapien Neanderthals and Homo sapiens and Denisovians and hominids that we don't even know what their names were. Heidelbergensis, all these things in one big sort of cauldron. And, um, and do you know what? If we spend a few minutes on what we're just about to discuss, something slightly revolutionary was said on Tuesday. I say you, we get this every now, probably once a week in one of the classes. Um, can I get this right? On Tuesday, one of the group, they said, uh, they said, what, what's the, uh, what's the, what's the maximum number of people or the, or the, or the mean number of people that you need, not maximum mean number that you need for a small population grouping to continue? or to survive. I said about 15. And then then we come up with this. Then we then we thought, right, if you look at um, uh, if you look at, say, the 
forty thousand years ago, when there's this nonsense that Neanderthals were wiped out and every other hominid was wiped out by human beings on the planet, in, in or whatever in Great Britain or whatever you want to look. At. If you, if you look at the population of Britain and you think about the numbers of people in Britain, you're talking about in maximum in Britain beyond twelve thousand years ago, maximum, right? I, I struggle to see thousands, not tens of thousands, thousands. I struggle to get the figure of thousands. So if you divide that into small groupings, you're talking about 20, 30, 40 groups of individuals spread over the whole of Britain or not over the whole of Britain because there's ice, but there's tundra. tundra. So so we go into one of those um, interstadial periods. So we talk about maybe 2000 people spread across the whole of Britain, right? Um, there's no way that um, one one group of those people are going to go out naturally wipe out the others. It's not going to happen. But, but what is going to happen is population density is going to be affected. And what we need meeting by population density is you're going to get you're going to get um, a group of 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 uh, we'll just use the, the common term the Neanderthals, right? Um, and we'll have a group of Cro-Magnon man, pure humans, right? Talk about. Third Reich and pure humans. Um, we're talking about other hominid groups. So, so let's just forget Neanderthals. Let's think, forget about Cro-Magnon and all the rest of it. Let's talk about group A, B, and C, and they all happen to be in Cornwall. So, so group B and C, right? They're quite happy. They, they, they they've never seen group A, and they, they never want to see group A because they're never going to see group A because it's miles away, and they don't even know where group A is, right? Um, group A sat, happens to be living up by Cheddar Gord. Group B happens to be living in Brixham, and Group um, um, C happens to be living in somewhere in Cornwall in a cave system we don't know existed and whatever. On the oh, but I, I'm I'm presuming they were living in a cave system. They're not. They're out on the tundra somewhere, right? This this cave thing. They they forget where they're living, right? But Group A, every single female is dead. They, they, every there's no females left right and the men realize that that their their days are over right a few just a just a year needs to go by one one group in that one group in that community's dead Th uh, three years go by another one one dead you know once there were many when there, there then there were few um then there were two then there was one soon there'll be none right so we've got all that right that's a quote from a film about um curlews actually um anyway um so so what does that group need to do it needs to find another group otherwise it's dead now if it goes to the other group and kills the other group then what's the point that means that you, you the quick extinction of humanity we're gone we're over right but what group what group need what group what this group eight needs to do it needs to find women and it needs to find them fast and it doesn't need to find it can find any woman right and actually, the same thing happens in um, Group C. It's just women. All the men are dead. All the men are gone. Right. So you you start to look at this, and this has implications for another period in history, and we're going to look at that as well now. Right? So it makes clear sense that for the survival, not the survival of the fit, fittest, the survival of the group, that they need to find another group, or they're dead. They're all dead. They're not going to survive. And Group C is going to die as well. Everyone. So what, what, what we need to do, we need to find another group in. And it's going to be so hard to find that group. And it's going to be absolutely exhausting. In the meantime, whilst, whilst Group A is trying to find Group B and C, right, some of those people are going to die. And they've got to do something quick. That's what this is about. It's not about going out killing people. It's about. And that is the mind telling you you've got to survive. And it doesn't matter what these women look like, what these men look like, you need to find them and you need to find them quick or it's over, right? Uh, it's the body clock. It is the body clock working there. And and I, the one thing I just nearly forgot, but my, my gray cells are actually working pretty well today, right? Pretty sharp. Um, and th this, this Viking thing, right? Vikings, we're supposed to be doing Paleolithic, right? There's certain evidence to say that um, on the islands of Orkney, sometime in the 600s, the native population of Orkney is in serious trouble. When we say serious trouble, it, it's extinction levels in Orkney 1,400 years ago, just before the Vikings get, get there. And the population is so 
depleted in Orkney. By the time the Vikings actually di di discover Orkney, right, there's very few people left alive. And the people that are left alive are almost absorbed into Viking society. Um, and you've answered it. You've asked a question there, which we need to do in a minute. It's something else that we discussed on Tuesday, but don't go there, right? So what we're, ta what we're talking about is that humanity needs to... I don't see the word procreation is is the be all and end all. So if procreation is a be all and end all, your your family group is buggered as well because you've got no idea of food, you've got no idea of what you just mentioned in that question, right? Which we're going to come on to. So this this idea that we that we need to find other groupings to survive is more important than wiping out other groupings, whoever they are, right? You need those other groupings. You really, really do. Um, and that comes up in the human mind again. Um, so, so for example, you've got you've got one ethnic group here and you've got one ethnic group there. That that person from that that ethnic group falls in love with the other ethnic group. The the idea of ethnicity goes. There's no them and us, and they get together and they have children. That's the way it should be. That's the way it is. That's the way that's the way it's always been. It's always been like that. And all these people who talk about black lives matter, white lives matter, um, all lives matter and all the rest of it, they're backing up another tree because it's all nonsense. Right. What is reality um, is that humanity um, needs to go forward because that's how our minds think. And however we go forward, we need other humans to do it. So back back to the one that leads us directly on to, if I go with this now, um, you mentioned, is that skull cut? Um, going back to Swanscombe, do you know what, right? We're not gonna, we're not gonna do that now. We're gonna do that next week. Right. <laughs> uh, um, and, and that's one thing I need to look into because you are right, you've got a good point there. So is that skull cut now, right? So what we got, does that help transfer technology between groups um the answer should be yes shouldn't it but i'm not going to come up with that yes answer um actually a, a group of people is what the group of people is so the group of people will find and get that technology even without other groups that that is clear we see that with easter island um, and Easter Island is extremely controversial. When we do an Easter Island, um, it's very likely that um, when we were doing Easter Island, we started to come to the conclusion um, that the people of Easter Island didn't wipe out the trees. It was the people coming into Easter Island who wiped out the trees, i.e. the Dutch and the English later on after the 1600s, 1700s. Right? So finding other groups... Um, might undo your technology. So the group to access other technology has to be based on the premise that a technology is required, not necessarily that it's put upon them. But there's, there's a good example of this, and I keep using this example, and I wish I'd written down where exactly this was when I found it. Um, a few years ago, I was reading, I was reading, about, I was, I was reading about Roman Britain. And um, there, there was a Roman villa that they they had actually constructed a a um, hypercore system, right? And this hypercore system had was perfect. It was perfect, and then they realised that the hypercore system had never been used. So what happened is that. A native Britain, we call them First Nation Britain, or somebody that somebody you had a daughter that had married somebody from Italy or whatever. Anyway, they 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 they, they had this technology built, but they never used it. They never ever used it. So this is why I said be careful when you say, does that help transfer technology between groups? Yes, but sometimes it really doesn't. It it um um it 
infringes on the technological development of the group. Isolation leads to techno technological innovation, right? And um, if have you have you ever have you ever seen that film Castaway with um, with 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 um, with Hanks? You ever seen that one? Ever seen the film Castaway? Yes, yeah. yeah, Tom Hanks. Yeah. Uh, very, very uh, basic. Um, yeah, I just um. But basically, Tom Hanks has all the technology, but he's got to start again. Um, he's got a torch. He leaves it on, and, he, and he's got no battery. So he, he's got to he's got to invent all this technology. He's got to start again, right? Even though he's got all this te he's got all this technology there, but he's got to use the technology for other things. And, it, and it's a great film. Um, and I, I remember seeing that years ago. Um, and for me. It was as good as watching um, the film Groundhog Day, right? Because no matter they, they've actually they're actually they, they're in in they've actually got the same formula, right? You've got everything, but you've got to start again, um, and you've got to reshape yourself. You've got to reshape everything, right? Um, and and the, the one the one thing that that we've got to see is that. Um, Pre prehistory is is more about the evidence um, and allowing the evidence to talk to us than forcing the evidence to tell us what it means. So, and somebody somebody then remarked on Tuesday. This is why it was so good to do this. They said, "Well, how can you base all this on a few bones?" And I say I'm not basing this all on a few bones. This is based on everything. But what what everything is, is only part of the jigsaw. Um, cave archaeology is only part of the jigsaw. So as far as we know, as far as we know, this this is blasphemy now, right? As far as we know, they they could have actually have been building roundhouses with with hearths out in the middle of the tundra. Um, and they had little communities and all the rest of it, yeah. And then the ice comes along and wipes it all out. Now, the reason why I'm saying that's blasphemy is people take that further, right? What they do with that, they 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 take that idea and they say, oh, actually, um, the ice. What there was at one time, there were great cities that existed forty thousand years ago with cars and planes and all the rest of it. And the ice came and it wiped everything out. That's not that's not exactly that's not what I'm saying. That is not what I'm saying at all. What I am saying is that we've got this tech that there were things that we don't know that like Doggerland, right? We know that Doggerland existed and Doggerland was highly advanced compared with what came after, and it and it took to reshape that. We know that because we can see the evidence, but with the ice, the evidence were removed and destroyed. Now, um, this is this is something that I I've not spoken about, and I don't think I've I've, I've spoken about this before, and I'm glad this is being recorded. Um, when Very I when I was when I was about um, when I was about um, eleven twelve years ago, I I I sat down and I thought, why why don't we have sanitation in caves? Why don't we have toilets in caves 12, 13,000 years ago? This is how we used to think. I had quite a sad brain when I was a child. Um, and I used to think, well, why couldn't they have done this? Why couldn't they have produced pottery? Why couldn't they have kept themselves warm? Why couldn't they have done blah, blah, blah? Right. And the problem is, the answer is I'm not going to find it. I'm not going to find it in a cave. I can't find it in a cave. But where I could find it is in places that have been completely erased by the ice. And I'm not going to find it. I might find it one day. What I was trying to do, I was trying to use a modern day analogy for a flawed archaeological context. Caves are flawed because it only represents part of the picture. However, 
if we excav excavate a Brixham cave in Tor Bay, where we not only have evidence of lots of the things that we talk about, human bones and so on, animal bones and eating and stuff, we might actually find evidence of habitation. And we have found evidence of habitation from the Bronze Age within the cave network of Brixham. Why are they living? That? Now, this, this, this is a strange thing. This is very strange. In in um, in in um, in the Bronze Age, ninety nine percent of our archaeology from the Bronze Age comes from sites that are not in caves. Probably more than that. If you if you read a book on the Bronze Age, right, it will talk. It will talk. I don't think you're going to find any references to the Bronze Age in caves, but you might, but mainly you're not. And even if you do, it's going to be a paragraph, right? And that's it. But what we've done, we found a lot of evidence from the Bronze Age in caves on the Gower, at Brixham, right? We've, and, and some of these other locations as well. But those two sites, the Gower and the Brixham area, we do have Bronze Age evidence of people working and, in the case of Brixham, living in the cave. Now, that go, that puts everything on its head. Why are people living in caves in the Bronze Age? But why are people living in caves in um, um, in, in, in Africa and in Spain, of all places? Spain, sanitation, electricity, gas in People living in caves in Spain today. Why are they doing that? Why, why can't they just be happy living out? You know. So, so the thing is, you see, that everything that we see about the Paleolithic period always needs to be challenged. And we cannot be obsessed with everything having more of a massive picture than it is, i.e. Pavilion Cave. Now, as you know, I believe that Pavilion Cave was forged from from genuine evidence. Um, and then we look at the other caves, and we actually find the evidence that we need to find. And um, but whether or not people agree with me saying that Pavilion Cave is forged or not. Um, it's it only gives us a tiny amount of the picture anyway so the significance of pavlan cave is is not as big as it's given it's important but the whole picture is important not these little bits you you can't it's it's like, it's like that old adage isn't it you can't uh, i was on a train this one time and there was there was this guy sitting opposite me right i didn't talk to him he looked a bit of a thug um, he had tattoos on his hands, right? And he looked a bit of a thug, thug, right? I didn't talk to him. I was on the train for like two hours. And about half an hour before he got off, he adjusted his jumper, his hoodie, and he had a dog collar on. Um, he was a priest. And I, I had judged this individual on the way he was dressed. And he talked to me quite eloquently. He was clearly a priest. And, and that is that is the point, that is the metaphor. Um, the, the, the Paleolithic period is so flowery and, and, and so in depth and, and, and so much that it's a really light and really interesting period in our time. They used to call the period be, before. 1066 dark ages but it's not it's illuminating it, it it stands out as being as being out there and, and being so amazing so what what i'd like to do i know i know you've got only a little bit of time now you've got seven minutes so we'll uh we'll leave a minute for questions so what we've got we've got no single descriptive 
um, environmental development of life in Britain. That's what we're talking about. Obviously, then, there is no um, single inscription to illustrate Paleolithic life. It's so varied. Human remains are few, but we don't need to be immortalized by that. Um, what we what we do have left is the dustbin of history. For example, the dustbin of our modern day society will be um, that suddenly um, most of the plastic and aluminium cans and paper that are in our rubbish tips have suddenly disappeared. Therefore, we must have stopped using them. We didn't. We use more paper and plastic and um, tin cans than we ever did, but they've just gone somewhere else. That's an interesting point. It's the same with the past. Tool making cultures are given various different names within the Paleolithic period. Names that I never use. Mousterian, which is the culture associated with the, the tools, the big tools that Neanderthals would have used. But I never use that. I never do that. What, what we need to think is about, again, back to where we started. We need to look out the leading lights of archeology. span And whereas anyone watching this today, this recording, or yourself, you might feel that I've, I've given the leakies a discredit to, um, I've, I've, I've disc in some way I've discredited them by saying, you know, um, you know, anybody would have found the evidence in Old Divide Gorge gorgeous they, if they had looked. No, they wouldn't have. It, it happened to be that the Leakies went there and they were highly skilled to do so after 1935. Louis and Mary Leakey. Without Louis and Mary Leakey's persistence, we would, we would understand so less the evolution of the human family. And I know I've said if they went to the Mon um, um, uh, Mongolia, um, they would have found the same evidence or somewhere else. Right? They they would still be amazing people. They they died and they died and bred. Um, Richard Leakey, um, you know, they 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 had children. They got grandchildren. Still continuing the work. Um, they they told us a way to go forward, and the way to go forward is 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 revolutionary. And they've helped us go forward. They've helped us understand um, Mary Leakey finding um, Latolo footprints in 1976, um, four years after the death of uh, Louis Leakey, for example, a beloved husband, and this is why they went out there and so on. Um, and obviously the other hominids and all the flints and everything that they found. Uh, this assists us in understanding, but not giving us the full picture, which we never will have. We can never have the full, I, I can, I, I, uh, even as much as I write down and as much as I've got a diary, I'm never going to remember everything I did yesterday. I'm never, it's never going to happen. So I'm never going to get a full picture of what happened to me yesterday. I'm never ever going to do it. In fact, I'm never ever going to remember every single thing that we've discussed now, but it's being recorded. But my feel that this is a point, even though this is being recorded, I'm not going to know the feeling of everything I felt when I was saying it whether I felt whether that was right or wrong, and eventually I got to be in it the right thing that I felt it was. So what we what we can't say is that um, the be-all or be-all and end-all of prehistory is about the Neolithic, the Bronze Age, and so on. It's about everything. So, and then then one thing that we need to do is think about, is think about um, where we see the evidence of the human family uh, in Peking. Um, we, we see... Homo erectusine remains, and we look at Aust Austra um, um, Australia, and we, and we, and we look at um, the, the, the new stuff coming in from the Americas and, and, and Europe, and we, we talk about early hominid remains being found in Romania and, and Germany and, and the likes of Turkey and, and Greece. Uh, uh, other than everything that we're finding um, in, in Africa, um, and we've got to say we've got to say that our early um, or early animals, um, were they vegetarians or were they just meat eaters and, and so on? It's all interesting stuff. They're, they're smaller individuals. They're robust. They changed. And, and th these changes were massive to them. They were huge. 
what what we what we can't think of is this we we can't we can't compare the microchip with what they were doing in the past so coming out of a tree and walking around is as revolutionary as the microchip and 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 the evolution from moving to eating one food to another food okay i know you've got to go now but but this, this is a good place to end um humans realizing that you can eat that and not eat that because if you eat that it will kill you right that's massive computers can't kill you they can um but these people had to make massive leaps tell you what if you put you and me in a tropical rainforest right um the best thing that you can you and i can do is to eat meat i'm a vegetarian not going to say that but would be to eat meat or to, um and the best thing to do is eat animals that have just died brilliant they might have died of, died, died of a disease we're going to catch that but these are um, massive revolutionary steps the same steps that we made to um invent concord that might not sound but it is it's the same thing so on that note let's think of swans come next week and let's go to swans come next week and try and understand um the caveat which is everything that we've done so um on that note um and you know what was said to me on tuesday i put so much information into tuesday that everyone at the end needed the sheet I'm hoping that I've not put as much information in Tuesday, but given the same amount of content in a different way. So I have done my talking. It is finally over to you, and then you've got to go. That was that was great. I mean, one thing that um, or question that's in the back of my head is um, you said <coughs> you raised that people say that these people lived only in cave dwellings, and then you went on to say, well, actually, the evidence of them been in the open area would have disappeared. Oh. Oh. What happened there? I've lost her with it. Anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm, not to... um, I'm not talking. Basically, they, they would have been hunter-gatherers of sorts. Therefore, logic says that you would have been following your yes. prey or, or and therefore you'd be out in the open areas. So you'd actually have camps that you would actually the, the 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 only way the only way for humanity to exactly the only way for humanity to have evolved would be to go out there if if everybody's living in a cave forever we wouldn't be here today yeah you wouldn't and, be doing it yeah because the animals might walk past but that's it they might be once every six months and the other thing as well is you'll have eventually eaten all the animals from the cave so so the fact all oh, they would have eaten you so the fact the matter is um it, 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 it is massive to think of um, the, uh, the big outdoors as being more significant than these caves, except the evidence in the caves is more significant than outside because we don't have it because it's yeah. gone. It's been erased. However, a metaphor for all this is as follows. And this is a huge one. The evidence that we found associated with Otzi, Otzi the Iceman was more evidence than, than you could find from the Neolithic period from Stonehenge. And that body was found out in the open in ice. Um, we know, I, 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 loads of people are going to disagree, but Otzi the Iceman and what we've learned from the Otzi the Iceman is more than we've learned from Stonehenge. And that, um, is everything that we've said. Because um, if say, for example, we found out in the open evidence from the Paleolithic period, and it does exist in Siberia, but for more periods in time closer to us, um, we, we learn so much more um, than, cave, cave archeology span is only one facet, and it's only a tiny facet. There's so much more out there. So, so yes. So um, ho hopefully, hopefully we we've uh, we we've managed that today. And um, and is there any other questions? No, that's that's it. Oh, thanks. Oh, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to disappear.
No, that, that, that's fine. That's okay. All right, then. Well, I'll, I'll hopefully see you next week. If not, get in touch and you can see the recording online. Yeah, excellent. Take have care, Richard. You have a great week as well. Take care. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Anyway, thank you for liking and um, like and subscribe online. God, that's really taken it out of me. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Thank you. We need a shave. Blunt. Take care, folks. Like and subscribe.